If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Today's chat's brought to you by Sophie Barrington and Archer Creative. If you'd like your horse business to have an appealing, easy-to-navigate website, then talk to Sophie Barrington at Archer Creative. Simply go to horsechats.com, search for Sophie, search for Barrington, or search for Archer Creative. Today's guest is Jules Van Dyke. Now, Jules returned to riding after a long break, and she's also a coach who's teaching riders returning to riding after a long break. And it happens, you know, where people lose confidence, they stop riding for a while, they start getting back into it and just not as fit and strong as they used to be. It takes a little while to get going again, it takes a little while to get their balance coordination again. And um, with that, losing a lot of confidence. Jules also teaches a wide variety of riders from, you know, young riders at four or five. And so she's pretty diverse with what with the people that she's teaching. How are you today, Jules? I'm very well, thanks. How are you, Glenn? Yeah, yeah, good, good. Now, Jules, I know you're, um, you're off to a meeting tonight, so we're not going to be a long time with you, but I'm sure you've got some valuable information for us. But before we get started, Jules, your favourite quote, what have you got for us? Okay, well, I wish I could tell you, Glenn, uh, who said this, but it was given to me by a very learned and wise old gentleman that I knew for a long time. And my quote is, if at first you don't get lost, there's a chance you might never find your way. Yes, yes. All right. <laughs> Would you like to tell us then about how how this has helped you in your journey with horses and how you would use it if you were coaching someone else? Well, it has actually helped me not just with horses but in life generally. But um, I think the importance of this particular quote is that we never learn from being in a, a space of comfort. Mm-hmm. Um, as human beings and as horse riders or as, in any profession, we don't change if we're just sitting in a really comfortable spot. We only really change and learn, I believe, through making some mistakes and through then going away and finding out and continually striving to improve and uh, be able to address those mistakes. And I think that that's the essence of this quote. Um, You know, it's nice to go in a lovely straight line in life and it would be nice to think that horse riding was a linear thing where uh, we start here and we get better each day and uh, it all goes forward nicely like that. But As many of us know, and anybody who's ever ridden a horse, it's just not like that. Um, We sometimes have a good day and we ride well and our horse goes well. And then the next day, it can be all turned upside down for all sorts of reasons. It might be that, you know, the human is the one that is not at their best that day. Or it might be that there are, you know, um, outside influences affecting the horse, um, even the weather and that sort of thing. And so it's not linear. But uh, what I believe is that every day that we ride our horse, even if we're having those bad days, they are particularly good opportunities for us to become closer with our animal, to be able to understand more about what's going on for them and the things that affect them. And the same with us as humans. Yeah, yeah. Yep, definitely, definitely. Now, I'm just thinking because you started with horses, you stopped riding for a while. You obviously enjoyed it when you were younger, but what brought you back to riding again? What brought you back to horses? Okay, well, look, I I did have horses on and off throughout my life, but Mm -hmm. I had a very long break mainly because of my career. And uh, it was, I was 57 and it was 20 years since I'd, had a horse and been riding regularly, and that is a very long time. Yep. Um, what had happened for me is that my husband had passed away, 
And uh, I decided that I would retire early and do the thing that I've really the only thing I've ever wanted to do. And that was to work with horses, to work with people who love horses and are passionate about that sport. And uh, that was around 2012. And I'm so fortunate to be able to have developed a very rich equestrian life. And uh, I must say that, you know, I've never really been happier. Um, All I do really is drive around in the country in a lovely car and end up where there's horses and it just doesn't get any better than that. (laughs) That's good. Yeah, very good. Very good. You've almost got a lifelong dream there. Well, it's full circle really because um, I started – you know, quite young in my very early teenage years, um, horse riding, even though I grew up in Sydney, uh, I used to spend most of all of my weekends really in holidays up here in the Hawkesbury initially pony club and all that sort of thing. Um, and uh, and during those teenage years, I was all also able to work on a riding school uh, where we had kids come for camps and things like that. So my coaching career, um, which is now, you know, developing, um, really started back in those days when I was fortunate enough to have even some private pupils um, that uh, had come from Pony Club and I was able to help them even all the way back then. And that's what I wanted to do with my life, but Mm -hmm. uh, I've had a a rich life nevertheless. Yeah. Um, But here I come back to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I've sort of had horses all my life and and drifted, you know, I could have been this or I could have done that, but um, I've always found horses have been, yeah, what I really wanted to do. So I can can certainly agree with you by saying that, um, you know, this life with horses is is pretty good, yeah. Well, there's another wonderful quote by Winston Churchill. Yeah. Who said, I think it goes along the lines of, there's uh, nothing so good for the uh, yes. for the inside of a man as the outside of a horse. I'm yes. sure you've heard that one. Yes, yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the horse you've got now, why you chose him. Okay, well, he's a lovely boy. He's an off-the-track thoroughbred. Mm. And um, the reason I chose him, I really needed to have a horse in my life. Uh, it's quite devastating to uh, to find myself without my husband. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know that if I want to make things better in my life, if I put a horse into it, then it always improves. And uh, I was fortunate enough to run into a friend of old friend of mine and she put me in contact with this gentleman who had an off-the-track thoroughbred and he needed to move it on. The syndicate had broken down. We went out and had a look at him and... Um, we were looking at a magnificent animal, really. Um, I'm so pleased that I was able to rescue him and he was able to rescue me. Um, he was called Jazzy Jack on the track and he's now called My Man Jazz. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we do dressage. Um, I went with my beautiful animals straight to um, a professional rider, uh, somebody who I know you know, Glenis, and that's Sam Fasher. Yes, And uh, I've been working with Sam. Um, He's been helping me with jazz uh, for the last five years. Um, I'm sure I could have come along a lot faster if I hadn't have had so many years away from riding. And Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would love to say to people who are listening is that, you know, if you have a passion for horses and you want to be able to ride, as I do now when you're 64 or, you know, even older, then try always to keep it up, you know, because it is such a challenge to come back to riding after a very long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What what bit of advice would you give to someone who is coming back, you know, because I know you teach people that are coming back to riding after a very long time, but for some of our listeners, you know, who, who are all around the world, what would you say to them? What are some bits of advice you'd give to them? Well, as you were saying before, it's physically very demanding. Yes. Um, I think that that is one of the most difficult aspects of it. And because many of us, if we've ridden before, we come back to it with an expectation that everything will be the same and we can jump on the horse and off we'll go and we'll have a merry old time. Um, That's absolutely not the case. 
um, I was shocked uh, to find that um, my my older body was in such condition. And so I suppose what I think people need to think about is, first of all, you need a horse that's fairly safe, mm -hmm. certainly one that is within your capabilities. And um, for people who, are, you know, don't feel confident to go and pick a horse themselves, I think one piece of advice is to, to get somebody to help you, somebody who you trust, somebody who um, maybe they're a professional or maybe they're just a very a person that's been with horses for a very long time, but somebody that can help you find a horse that, you know, will suit your capabilities, will suit your physical structure, if you know what I mean. So, um, you know, don't go and buy an 18-hand horse when you're five foot four. Yes. Um, you know, these sorts of things, because it makes it such a challenge for you. Mm. I found, um, you know, I really had set myself up quite a lot with Jazz because he was off the track. And, but um, I'm so glad that I did it that way because I've learned so much more. If I'd been on a horse that was very well schooled, perhaps it would have been more physically easy, um, but I wouldn't have learned as much. And I don't think I would have built the strength in my um, body that I'm really starting to really feel now um, to be able to get it right. The other thing is that, you know, People have to be patient with horses and they also have to be patient with themselves. So set realistic goals, you know. I often run into people who, you know, have great dreams about what they want to do and their goals that they've set are perhaps a little bit beyond their capability at the moment. We always want goals to be stretched, but we don't want them to be unachievable. So I set myself... Um, you know, some short, medium, long-term goals. Uh, and I worked through them in an iterative way. And um, I was kind to myself, you know. I didn't come home and beat myself up when I saw the video of my position and that it was all over the place and it was so hard for me to maintain it. I just recognised that that was part and parcel of me developing my muscles, my core and my ability to to manage my body and that's going to be part of my process for the rest of my life um, as I said I'm not a young person um, and uh, but I do when I look forward in my life I see myself riding for a very long time and uh, you know I, I know that every year it gets a little bit easier <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and the horse comes along with me um, and, you know, I'm starting to really feel like uh, we're coming together. So the other thing for people to think about is um, if they don't have realistic goals and they haven't found the right horse, they can really affect their confidence. It's so important to um, minimise the anxiety that goes along with coming back to riding after a long time. So that's why one of the reasons it's so important to have a horse that may not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a highly educated horse, but it needs to have the right temperament so that it can cope with, you know, a rider that perhaps isn't as stable as they used to be, and they can cope with external influences and not be overly flighty or overly stimulated by these things, because that tends to rattle us a bit, and the worst thing that can happen is that our confidence is shot and so we don't ride. And, uh, you know, there's nothing more important to riding than absolute determination and the work that goes along with improving our abilities. Yeah, yeah. Just thinking about, you know, the whole getting back into it and the horses and also to the amount, you know, like you obviously now can feel that in the couple of years you have been back riding that your skill level has improved and kept improving. Would you recommend then to someone who is getting back into riding to just go and have a few lessons on a quiet horse and get themselves back in the saddle again? Oh, absolutely. Um, I actually did start doing that. Um, mm -hmm. I was in the city still yep. and I was going to um, Centennial Parklands and yes. started there before I was able to find jazz. And uh, uh, look, even, even – look, 
I don't think any of us can do really well unless we can see what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So we either get a video and we work with that or better than that is to find yourself a coach, somebody who you can um, understand and everybody's different. All coaches explain things differently. Some things you might hear from different people five times and then somebody says it and go, oh, God, that's what I've been (laughs) trying to to grapple with, Mm. and that person has just explained it in a different way. Um, So find that coach that really can help you or, as you say, you know, go to a riding school. Even doing trail riding can be so good because it's about having more hours in the saddle, being able to develop that strength, uh, that core, the balance, um, so, you know, it really doesn't matter what activity you're doing on a horse and the same for the kids, you know, for the little kids, what they need more than anything is, um, to be spending those hours in the saddle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you, you know, if you want to put your judge's cap on because you've been doing some judging, you've sort of come back into horses and got your own horse doing some judging as well, but for you as a judge, what's a common problem you see with your younger riders and what's a common problem you see with your older riders that are at a more novice level? You know, thinking that if someone's been riding every day of their life and been out competing, they may not necessarily be, be um, you know, going in some of the lower levels unless they've just got a young green horse. But, but are there differences between younger rider problems and older rider problems? So thinking as a judge, do you see different things? Because I'm going to ask you then as an instructor as well. Well, I think you do. I mean, um, I must say that um, coming back to riding now, I'm very impressed with uh, the the skill level of some of our younger riders, meaning, um, you know, the teenagers, the young ones in their early 20s and that sort of thing, the quality and um, uh, level of riding in Australia has greatly improved um, over the couple of decades that I was missing from it. Um, But, yes, they are different things. With young kids, it's all about having fun and uh, it's all about developing those very basic uh, abilities to steer the horse, to, to stop the horse, to you know, rise to the trot. And um, for those kids, it's really about hours in the saddle. With some of the older riders that I see now um, that are coming back to it, it's a lot of the things that I was grappling with myself. Um, Their physical health sometimes isn't always where they need it to be. um, And that can affect their ability to maintain, um, you know, the hours that they need to be able to improve their riding. So their fitness is mm-hmm. one of the things that I believe people need to work on, not just on the horse but off the horse, although the best uh, development of our muscles um, for riding actually happen while we're on the horse. But core strength um, development can be done both on the horse and off the horse. So balance issues I see a lot with some of our riders that are coming back Um and not everybody, uh, you know, was at a very high level when they stopped riding. And so they come back with an expectation that things will be the same. And they may not be. Um, but um, so we see still issues of people uh, with their steering, you know, of their horses, with their ability to keep a connection, a contact. Um, that's often a very... A big struggle. One thing I would say that is so important for all of us and particularly people coming back, don't be too overly focused on your position, right? And now there might be people all around the world going, what's she talking about? Positions, everything. Um, Look, really, at the end of the day, it is important. We all know that. Uh, And to have our horses going in a very... um, very connected way uh, for them to be straight, for them to be balanced, etc. Um, being in a in a correct position can is very important, but being an effective rider is far more important. Mm. Um, we can't get to the point where we can sit neatly on a horse 
until we can be effective on the horse. Yep. So, and this is something that Sam Fash has very much uh, taught me and, and sunk, has sunk in through the work I've done with him. Um, being effective, being able to to manoeuvre your horse, to be able to change their outline, to be able to um, move them up and, you know, a little bit forward, a little bit together, these sorts of things. It's far more important at the beginning of coming back to riding than whether you look pretty on the horse or not. Mm. Um, for the first few years, you're probably not going to look pretty on the horse. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, just keep working at it, put the hours in, and develop effectiveness in your riding. Yeah, yeah. And, and it can be a balance both, can't it? But it, I'm just thinking of someone going around having a beautiful position and their horse is just bolting out of control, you know, but they're keeping a lovely position. Um, oh, we and, can see that. Yeah. All their horses are so jammed together and sucked back that they can't move properly. Mm, um, mm. I think, you know, and, and we see a lot of that um, and, and people are, uh, you can see the people are finding it difficult not to swing on the reins. That's yes. another thing that we see a lot of from both younger riders and people, uh, sorry, uh, the very young kids, obviously, yep. and uh, from people that are coming back to riding. And part of that is because it's so hard to keep your position mm. and it's very hard not to do that. Um, but, you know, as you say, Looking pretty, it's just not where it's at, mm, you know. It's mm. how your horse is moving, how your horse is going. And if your horse is, as a judge, if I see a horse that's going along nice and softly, they're, step, they're you know, they're stepping through, they are um, well balanced, etc. then uh, if the rider is a little bit forward in their position or they're not, you know, their legs are, might be a little bit busy, I'm not worried about that. It's far more important that uh, the horse is able to move nicely. Now, it's chicken and egg stuff, as you know, Glenis, you know, <laughs> um, what comes first, the, the position or, the, or the, the suppleness and softness of your horse. But, um, and there isn't really a clear answer to that. But I think for us to keep our confidence when we're coming back to riding, don't become, please, overly focused on on yes. looking nice, yep. let's be focused on getting the horse moving properly and developing the skills that we need to be able to make that happen. Yeah, And I think being an effective rider is going to make you more confident than just a pretty rider. Oh, it does. Mm. And, of course, eventually when you get your horse more balanced, it's easier yes. to maintain your position. Mm -hmm. So um, this is also something that's very much learned by people like myself who are, who are bringing horses off the track because when the horses first come off the track, there's not a chance that you would be able to be looking pretty mm. because the horse hasn't got the strength to do, to be able to move in the way that we are looking for in a dressage arena, um, hasn't got the strength to use its hindquarters the way that we want it to. Um, they have their old habits of bearing down into your hands and these sorts of things, and and that pulls you out of position anyway, even if you are a, a professional rider. So, um, you know, it's very important that we don't become overly focused on just looking good, you know? Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if you were going to, um, you know, and I'm thinking if you, you go to do a clinic or go for a new rider and you're trying to do some exercises to get them to be more effective, what sort of exercises would you use? Um, for the little kids, uh, I do a lot of grid work, so set up poles in ways that, you know, they really have to steer. Yep. Um, I use games, of course, bending and all of those normal things, um, but that's partly also because you're wanting to keep the little kids engaged. With the older riders, um, I think to do a, a, a little bit of cross training is important as well. So, you know, again, I might use some pole, poles with them mm -hmm. um, to, uh, you know, so that they can feel what it's like when the horse perhaps is a little bit more elevated in their movement and that sort of thing. Um, using serpentines is very useful uh, because people have to, you know, they get a new outside rein and a new inside leg um, every time they change on the serpentine. 
Uh, so doing also using loops. Um, I think you know, understand what I mean. Say uh, a loop from M to X and back to F. like a ten meter loop. Uh, these, yep. yeah, ten yep. meter loop. These are very useful as well. Um, look, uh, I think for coaches and also for riders, there's some wonderful materials out there uh, in terms of um, books. And one of them, so I think it's one oh one hundred and one um, riding exercises. I yes. Yep. Try and find that. Yes. Uh, and I can tell you in there, there's some really great, um, and it's all quite visual uh, with some good pointers as well. There's some really good exercises in there that I think people can use also. Um, it's partly, the other reason why they're really good is that they keep, the rider and the horse thinking all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, you know, just riding around in circles all the time is not only going to drive you mad, but it's certainly going to drive your horse mad. And so trying to mix it up with different exercises that we can access, that everybody can access, um, either on the internet or, as I said, through the print media, um, is, is really important because uh, it keeps us focused. Another one is learning the gears, but within a pace. So as with the little kids, it's a game called traffic lights where, uh, you know, you've got red for stop, orange for slow and green for fast, you know. Uh, But um, with all of us, you know, we haven't just got three gates. Uh, We've got... Trot, yes, but there's gears within trot. So Mm -hmm. people are getting used to moving up a little bit, so, you know, taking some bigger strides and then moving back a bit, taking some shorter strides. That can be done within all paces. And every time we do it, we have to think as a rider, but it also keeps our horse thinking all the time. So making sure that when you go, when your horse goes, he goes with you. You know, he doesn't go on his own. And uh, for riders coming back to riding, um, perhaps their confidence isn't so great. They really need ways to keep their horse's attention. And um, that uh, gears within the pace uh, is one that can really help with that. And yep. I use it quite a lot with the riders. Yep. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Now, just thinking about, and I know that you've got an off-the-track thoroughbred now, but thinking of a particular training exercises you use for an off-the-track thoroughbred that you think that you may not need for a horse who hasn't had that racing experience, you know, specifically for an off-the-track thoroughbred. All right. Gee, you're asking me a hard one now. Well, you're such a good explainer. You know, you, you're doing... Okay, <laughs> correct. Yeah. Right, uh, look, um, the traits of a horse coming off the track, when they come off the track, most of them are like three- or four-year-olds, you mm-hmm. know, in terms of their level of understanding. They uh, really have only ever been taught to go straight ahead. <laughs> yep. Go straight ahead, go fast. And uh, they often even haven't had that very basic breaking in that um, we used to do in the old days where we took time over that. Uh, they're often rushed through that. So uh, I think what's really important is that we, we don't ask too much of them. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't expect too much of them. Um, and that we understand that they are going to be perhaps a bit stronger in the hand uh, than uh, another, you know, a more well-educated horse in some of the other breeds um, or some of the other disciplines that horses have been involved in in a previous career. So the sort of exercises that we did were, you know, some of them are the basic ones of, you know, getting the horse to, to answer the leg Getting the horse to answer our reins and our legs for steering, making sure that as riders uh, and every single rider I work with, and sometimes I'm still guilty of it myself, making sure you're always looking where you're going, you know, not down at your horse's neck, because the horse, and particularly, I don't know why, but off the track thoroughbreds do actually take a lot of lead from that. So 
So we need to always be giving them that assistance by perhaps turning our head in the direction that we need to go. That helps them. Um, try and be soft with them, but, uh, you know, they will be stronger in your rain. So when we first start, we come out for our warm-up. We do a lot of walk, halt, do like a three-point turn. So yep. do a quarter turn, halt, do a quarter turn, halt, walk on. These sorts of things, again, they keep the horse thinking and they also eventually become a little bit lighter in the rain through this walk halt exercise. And only after we've done that for a while um, do I actually start to pick up the trot on them. And then we will work on a circle um, initially. It's, uh, it's easier for the horse in some ways. It's harder in others, but it's easier <laughs> for the horse in some ways. And um, also for the riders, uh, it does depend a little bit on the mood of the horse. If they're really goy, then you'll put them on the circle. And if they're a bit dull, you might use the whole arena and and uh, go large, if you know what I mean. Yep, yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that can help motivate them a little bit more. Keep doing different things. Don't bore them to death. Mm-hmm. That's the other thing with uh, off a the track. They're very bright. Uh, thoroughbreds are quite intelligent animals. The great thing about them is that if you teach them something once, they really forget it, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to some other breeds that we won't talk about, <laughs> um, where you have to keep <laughs> teaching them Going the over same it. thing yep. over and over again. Uh, thoroughbreds are incredibly bright, um, and uh, so they also get bored easily. Mm-hmm. So keep, you know, use your circles, but don't overuse them. Use your serpentines, don't overuse them. And uh, change it up for them, you know. I, I think that's really important. Okay, good, good. All right. Now, Jules, what are you looking forward to now? You've got your your horse. I think he's going novice and he's going into elementary next year. I'm sure you're going to keep judging. Anything else you've got up oh, your yeah. sleeve? Ah, oh, well, at the moment I've just become a member of the Sydney um, Dressage Organising Committee, Sydney mm-hmm. Dressage in Cork. Yep. Well, I'm going to a meeting later tonight. And, the one uh, that we're holding that... you up from? Oh, no, no, you're not. <laughs> no, I have planned this, so I'll that's be there okay. on time. Yep. Um, but, um, and that's really fantastic. One of the things I love about it is to, it's uh, amazing the amount of work that people do to make an event happen. And uh, even as a volunteer, it's not always uh, easy to see this. But it's certainly something I would encourage everybody who's got anything to do with the sport horses um, or the sports or the pony clubs, because I also judge a lot at pony club, um, to to become involved as much as you can when you're off the horse as well as on the horse. Um, It's amazing to see how much work it takes, but also how much, uh, you know, organisational skills and in doing it, you develop a lot of contacts yes. and that helps you with moving through the, the equestrian world because, you know, as I said before, you might want to hear something said in a different way and uh, building these contacts is important. For myself, um, I'm working to uh, upgrade my level as a coach um, and upgrade my level as a judge um, those two things go hand in hand because um, as a coach, we have to, uh, if we want to level up, we have to participate and um, compete at a certain level and and get a certain score in order to be able to, to do that And in addition to our horse management and, and actual coaching skills, of course. Yep. Um, the same with judging. You know, you need to sometimes be at some levels be able to demonstrate that you can can do the movements yourself and you have to, again, be able to compete at a certain level and get a certain score. So all the things that I'm doing in this beautiful life I'm having actually all dovetail together to to help me to lift my skills, to lift Mm -hmm. my skill level to be able to help others. And uh, certainly, you know, my whole working life has been about helping others, whether it was through a question or not. Um, my career was uh, in human services and, uh, you know, that's one thing that I absolutely love. So increasing my coaching abilities and my skill level and my qualification level is number one on my agenda mm-hmm. and uh, 
being able to uh, do the same with judging, which is something that I'm really, really enjoying very, very much. Good, good. All right, now just summing up your philosophy, you know, if you're going to just a a sort of almost a leaving message for people, what would you say to people about the horses they're riding, confidence, particularly someone who's maybe lost a little bit of confidence and wants to get back on and start riding again? Be kind to yourself and to Mm -hmm. your horse. Be determined. Don't give up. Um, Be prepared to, uh, to have a failure and... Use what I call action learning, I guess, um, reflective thinking to be able to improve how, uh, yourself and how you can move forward with your horse. But the main thing is don't give up. All right, good advice. Jules, if people would like to contact you, what's the best way? The best way, um, I have an email, is julesvandyke at bigpond.com. My telephone number is uh, my mobile zero four double zero nine two zero eight seven eight, and uh, if somebody didn't get that down, then uh, they can always go to the Equestrian Australia website and search either the coaches list or the judges list. Or they could go to horsechats.com, search for Jules, search for Van Dyke, or search for Jules Van Dyke, and I'm sure they'll um, find again because not everyone's got a pen in in their hand as they're driving along. A lot of people tend to listen to podcasts as they're driving. Jules, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your great answers, and I kept throwing some extras in there just because you're giving such great answers, and I think um, lots of valuable tips there for people you know, to help with their riding, right. their coaching and their judging. Well, thank you so much for asking me, Glenis, and it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jules. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.